Hello everyone, welcome back to the Red YouTube channel and to yet another episode of the Solitary series with me, Jonathan Petz. And today, somehow we've made it to episode seven, uh, I think, and this is Menu Tactics Part Two. So I want to thank everyone who's tuned in. Just going to wait to make sure we've got audio coming through. Let me know you can all hear me loud and clear. Really looking forward to what we're going to be showing you today. Um, in Menu Tactics Part One, we are very much looking at the fundamentals of some of the cool things we can do with a DSMC2 or Ranger camera. And today, we're going to be formulating that into a really nice set of easy presets to bounce, be bounce between when we're working on set and we're in and amongst it on set. So I reckon we kind of dive right in and we look at the presets we're going to be making today. So let's have a look at my menu screen. Now I'm working on two monstros here. I've got a DSMC2 monstro, which we're looking down the barrel of the lens at, and I've got a Ranger monstro to show how you can move them between different bodies. And this is probably the first little flag that I will like to raise to everyone is that when we're building presets and settings in cameras and moving them between each other, even including different sensors, um, if you haven't got a certain module attached, you can't assign settings for it. So for example, I've got the Pro IO module attached at the moment. I can't go and assign SDIs that I don't have on the back of my camera. I would need to attach this module to get access to configure those. Likewise with my side handle, to assign the record button, the little wheels, all those kind of things, I need to make sure they are attached to be able to configure those. So just to set something um, up for you guys. So let's have a look. I was basically thinking, what is a preset that is going to be great for people who are self-shooters and also those working on a set, maybe if you're an AC, a DIT, maybe even a DOP. And I kind of came up with a little thing that I've, I've kind of done for when I worked as a DIT and mixed in a few other little bits in there as well. And the framework of this is built around the use of soft keys. So we looked at these very briefly in the last episode and the power that you can do with those and the ability to chop between LUTs and frame guides. And today we're actually looking at a series of presets to go between a anamorphic mode, a spherical mode, a high speed mode, maybe even a VFX open gate lowest compression mode. And let's have a look at how some of those work. So we've got our base preset here. This is our day-to-day -day shooting. 25 FPS, 24p, obviously, if you're in, uh, in other countries in the US, that kind of thing. Uh, 180 degree shutter, 8K full frame. I've gone for a Fincher style 240 to 1, so you've got some wiggle room to move around and reframe. And if our boom man's getting a little bit too close for comfort, he's got a little bit of wiggle room in there as well. Other ones we've got, because we're on a Monstro, we've got the ability to have S35 lens coverage as well. So we've got an S35 preset in there as well. At 6K, that's about 2% larger than helium in terms of the effective pixel count. We then have a 4K 120 mode. So this loads straight into 4K 120 FPS and a 144 degree shutter. And we've then got 8K open gate, lowest compression um, as possible as well. On the left-hand side, we've then also got a series of LUTs and also frame guides. So I'm just gonna go back into my main preset. And the LUTs are really cool because in this specific configuration, they are independent from the other presets. So you can apply a LUT and it will retain in every preset we load. We change the LUT. So for example, you can see I'm on red ST4 here. I'm gonna load my show LUT, which is one of Phil Holland's lovely LUTs. And if we go into S35 mode, you'll notice that the preset doesn't default back to ST4. It retains that fill color LUT there as well. Likewise, that's the same for our social media aspect ratios and our frame guides. I had a lot of people in the last episode asking me, how do I do social media, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat filters, because we're all shooting a lot of those kind of things. We're doing 16 by nine content as well at the same time shooting that slightly odd aspect ratio. And the way we've configured it and how I'll show you today is that it's not resolution dependent. This will work in any resolution. So you can see we're in 6K here and we've got nine by 16. If I now go back into 8K and reapply it, you'll see that it's working the exact same way. Let's have a little look, that's loaded in. Nine by 16 as well. So completely not dependent on the resolution. It's basically doing the maths for us. Apart from that, we've got a series of hotkeys, 
um, on the side of the camera, which we'll see in a moment. And there's some deeper settings in there as well that's basically setting the camera up, which we'll dive into now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to completely wipe this camera because at the very end, we're gonna copy everything we make and put it back onto that camera just to show you how easy it is. So I'm gonna come in, restore system, wipe camera, and now that camera is going to go through its process of wiping. So here we are on a DSMC2 Monstro. Now let's start building a preset from scratch. What are some of the things we want to consider very early on? I always dive straight into my settings. So I'm going in here, what are the things I'm going to need to configure to have across all of my cameras and that I'm going to want across all of my presets, regardless if it's 4K 120 or 6K S35. I'm going to be going in, I'm going to be setting up my slate information. So my camera, which camera have I got? Uh, I'm going to be working with um, a camera team. There's an A and a B camera and I've been given the VFX camera because they're prepping those cameras. So as opposed to setting A, B, C, D camera, I'm gonna come in and, and select E camera because we're eventually gonna switch over. What else have we got in there? Time code, let's start getting all these things that are fundamentals. Time code, external, yes please. Frame rate, what's gonna be our project time base? Uh, it, I'm in Europe, I'm shooting 25. Do you wanna go a little bit crazy, go 48 FPS? <laughs> um, get that dialed in now. Other things you might want to get set up in here, um, we're going to go into our recording modes. Are we doing any proxies? Let's get that dialed in now. Are we doing ProRes? Are we doing DNX HD? We've got other lessons in the Solitary series that go into proxies, so feel free to watch some of those. Um, what else do we need to go set up? We need to set up some of our communication. Do we need to set up Wi-Fi? Do we need to get our control protocol set up for our um, C-Motion Wireless Follow Focus, our Bartek, our Teradek? Um, our, our Preston, let's get that dialed in now, making sure it's all working with all the accessories we've got. Let's get our fan control set up, which mode we're we using for our fan control. And at this point, we're starting to get to the stage where it's like, okay, let's start dialing in the rest of our settings. Let's get our time and date set up. Yeah, mine's 2010. Um, GPIO and sync, get those dialed in now as well. But now let's come back out and just start working our way through some of the things that I like to configure. Like we talked about last time, editing lists. With my frame rates, I love to edit my list just because typically I don't need 24 FPS when I'm shooting 25 FPS. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's a rather odd requirement. Do I need 30 FPS? Chances are no. I'm going to do 25, 50, and 60. Those are the ones I'm frequently going into. And for, and for a cameraman coming in on a daily, it's really nice they can just dive straight in and get exactly to the frame rates that they need. Obviously, this is a discussion you have with your DP, your production, those kind of things as to the frame rates you might be shooting as there could be some scenes that are 12 FPS or one FPS, in which case you can add those to your list. But again, the beauty is you can configure this the way you want. ISO, this is something we're not gonna be baking into the preset. The benefit of this is that we can be shooting S35 underslung Steadicam. We expose the 2000 ISO, boom, we've got the shot. Let's go back to full, uh, back to full frame Vista Vision. We load that preset back up and our exposure doesn't change. It doesn't go back to a base of 800. We're, we're staying at that 2000 that we are exposing that scene to. T-stop, obviously we can't make lists for those. Shutter angle, I leave those. Same for white balance and my resolutions as well. But like I talked about in the last episode, I do like to shrink down my um, compression ratio list just to keep it neat, neat and tidy. And then that way nobody's gonna be going and messing with my settings. Other bits we're looking at, we're looking at the image. What image pipeline are we gonna be using? Let's start to get this baked in. Let's discuss with our DP, if you're a DIT. If you are the DP, now's the, the time to make your decision. Is this project going to be medium contrast, soft highlight roll off? Do I wanna have a hard highlight roll off? Obviously, it's metadata, so it doesn't ultimately matter, but this is always what the preset is going to default back to if you end up changing it. While we're here, let's import our lookup table. So if you've got a series of LUTs you want to use as your show LUT, your interior night, uh, your interior day, exterior, so on and so forth. Let's get those imported now. So to get them imported into a DSMC2 or Ranger camera, on your mini mag, create a folder called LUTs in lowercase, L-U-T-S, and put all of your cube files in there, and then you can import them straight away. But don't apply them yet. Don't apply any LUTs at this stage. And now we go into monitoring. So this is the first bit that we're actually gonna start looking at creating something bespoke. 
So typically your image output is gonna look like this. This is what you're gonna be getting through your HDMI, through your SDI. But personally, when I'm on set, I like to get rid of the information that the producer, the director, the client, do they really need to see that HDRX is turned off? Do they need to see that the audio is turned off? Not particularly. So let's build something that gets us all the information we need and focuses the people on the image and not getting distracted by the settings or me navigating through menus. So I'm gonna show you what I've built. So I'm gonna come in and I've got one already pre-made framed overlay so that all the settings are in a black bar and not overlaid on the image and auto hide menus. And this is what we are going to be creating. So this is the output that's gonna be going through SDI. Uh, just seen a comment, uh, LUTs. Yeah, LUTs in lowercase, L-U-T-S. And this is what we're creating. So we can see we've completely trimmed it down really nice and clean and we're focusing on the image but we've still got a lot of information there that is going to be very key to making sure we've got the the data in the shot that we need so top left e it's e camera we can easily see a b c d e which camera we're we shooting with we've got all of our main settings 25 fps 180 um, iso white balance just like in the normal menus on the normal output but just shrunken down so it's not as obtrusive bottom right i've got the time code but i've made it slightly larger because typically script continuity they're the ones that are having to keep an eye on the time code for when key things happen and either they're sat furthest away in video village or the video department's giving them the smallest monitor possible so trying to give them a little bit of a helping hand there we've got our histogram and traffic lights i've shrunken this down because typically i'll be looking at those on the camera or i'll be in my dit village or dit tent sorry with my vector vector scopes waveforms those kind of things so if the dp goes into uh, the director tent at least there's some gauge on how the exposure is sitting we've got our mag information obviously that's very important calibration nice and small just so if i'm walking around set or if the dp is looking at the other cameras he can see yep good the calibration is on point and finally the power so a lot of really cool information been going on there now let's see how we can actually make one of those so I'm just going to come in and I'm just going to turn that back off. So I'm going to come in and just reset that back to standard. I'm going to turn off my auto hide menus just so it's not flicking on and off. And to build these, we're, we're actually going to go into menu and overlays and into custom. Now you're going to go and press create. So we're going to make a brand new one, but I'm going to show you the one like a true cooking show host that I made already. And this is the screen that you are basically going to be presented with. So we've got a load of these boxes which represent where in the image you want to have them positioned. And at this stage, start diving in to see what the cool things are that you can have overlaid. Now, there's tons and tons of things and bits of data you can have input there. My personal favorite is the custom label. So if you really want to get in the director's good books when it's his birthday, you come in and put happy birthday, Mr. So-and-so. Or if you want to get on the good books with the production, get the production name in there. Maybe your unit, maybe if you're a VFX unit or something, have that data in there. So it's all kind of being output to everybody on set. Um, loads of really powerful things in here. Great for visual effects, people who want to get that valuable metadata and reference it on, on, on their daily sheets, um, which we will show you how to make a VFX kind of output preset. But at this stage, I'm just going through FPS. You can see the names of all of these that I've got configured. Top right, I've got my record indicator. Very important to know when we're recording. Uh, time code, as you can see, I've got that as text size normal. So it's slightly larger just so we can make sure either that we're time code jammed or we can uh, make a reference for our notes and power and calibration. So that's all we needed to do. We've come in. Uh, you can stack them if you want to. There really is loads in there. Just, just spend a couple of minutes seeing what's in there that might suit you. Once we've saved that, we are going to clone it. So I've gone in, I've cloned it, and this is basically gonna help us make our VFX overlay. So you clone it, rename it, and the only change I've made for this specific one is the gyro. So that way, when we're shooting VFX, the gyro data can be going out and they can be making notes. Oh yeah, that shot went down 10 degrees. Oh, they went this way by a couple of degrees. Just to help give everyone all the data that they basically need. So once you've done that, we can go out and basically assign those to our various SDI outputs. So if you've got the production module, we can start assigning different outputs to different SDI should we need to. Um, so going into monitoring, monitors, HD SDI, or oh, we've got VFX overlay in there. 
let's change that so our director is getting his specific output. One thing to note, just make sure you turn off the tools so he's not freaking out by getting all the exposure tools and the false color modes um, when you're checking. At this stage, obviously, make sure your EVF, all your, all your outputs that you want through those, how your LCD is configured, what setup you want on there as well. Get that all dialed in now. And at this point, we are now going into the bit that I've got a lot of questions about, and that is the frame guides. So I'm just going to apply my main preset just so everything is set up here. Preset, let's apply that. Get that loaded up. And I've gone for a 240 to 1, but this could be where you're in an anamorphic mode. So you may not need frame guides. Maybe you're doing 8K 6x5. Maybe you're actually shooting 7K because you've got a quirky lens that has weird lens coverage. Um, obviously, this is completely up to you. But what I've done is I've gone 240 to 1 and 5%. So as opposed to 100%, which goes right to the edge of frame, I've got that little bit, little bit of wiggle room. Now, one thing that you should do is you should shoot what's called a frame leader. So that's basically the process of, if we back out here, helping your editor out by confirming what frame you are actually framing for. So basically what you do is you kind of point at a flat wall, um, you can get a, a focus chart in there, and you basically put little triangles in each of the four corners of the frame guide and each of the four corners of the entire frame itself. Then that way they know, okay, that's the entire frame and this is what they're framing for. So you're both 100% sure on the frame that's being delivered to them. And I would always have to spend hours doing that because there'd always be so many different resolutions and aspect ratios we're shooting. Um, obviously for editing by yourself, you, you kind of know this, you can calculate it, but it just helps those guys out. But where was I? Uh, guides. Now the next bit, the bit that I got so many questions about, social media frame lines. How do I make them? What do I do? So most people that I've seen making these social media frame guides go into absolute and they basically work it out from the resolution they're shooting. And this is fine, no problem with that. But the negative is that if you go into 6K and the resolution changes, all of those numbers are gonna be completely off. But you know we've got a, a pretty powerful machine next to us, so let's have that do all the hard work for us. So go into user, and let's say we want to make a nine by 16 Instagram or a four by five, but let's start off with nine by 16. To get the number that goes in here, literally just do nine divided by 16. And with my very quick math skills, not looking to my left and working it out, it is 0 0.5625. Five, carry the one. Yeah, that's correct. Definitely not cheating there. I haven't got it written down already. Um, so 0 0.5625, 2430 by 4320. That is looking correct already. I've got it set to yellow, not relative to the frame guide. I want it to be the whole height of the image we're recording. And there we go. Look, we have built our nine by 16 aspect ratio ready for social media. But what if we want to do four by five? I think that's actually what the Instagram um, videos are. If we come back in, 4 divided by 5, that's 0 0.8. So 0 0.8. Dial that in. Boom, there we go. We've got our 4 by 5. Super easy. And you can do it for any aspect ratio that you need, basically. But we're not saving the action guide at this point. We want to be able to toggle this on and off. So come in and just turn that off for the moment. And the only other thing we want to set up in here is that we want to come in set our center dot. I want some sh black shading, well, not black shading, I want some shading around my frame guide so I can focus on the image. I know clearly what's in frame and what's out of frame. So I've set up my shading there as well. Boom, perfect. We're now moving on. What's next on my list? Oh, hot keys and soft keys. So this is the stage where the presets really start to come together. And the first bit of that is with our shortcuts. So we've got some shortcuts here on, on the home screen, I guess you could say. And in the last episode, I did talk about this, but Clay Reed, our in-house filmmaker, has going to show us another way of doing this, and he's made a little video for us. So I'm going to say, Clay, take it away. What's up? I'm Clay from Red, and today I'm going to help you set up a menu shortcut. On my camera, I use a menu shortcut so I can quickly dive into the sensor calibration window. I shoot a lot of time lapses, and when I do, I love seeing light trails. So I shoot at one frame per second at a 360 degree shutter. That means that the sensor is getting exposed for a whole second per frame. 
That also means that I'm going to need a separate black shade calibration to ensure that I have good image fidelity. And I want to set up a shortcut because I'm lazy and that menu is like five clicks deep. So here we go. We're going to select menu, add a shortcut, use this drop down menu to navigate, slide down to menu, settings, maintenance, calibrate, sensor. That's going to be your path. Now I've got this little easy button right down here. That means I can keep creating and stop clicking around in menu structures. All right, thanks for watching and keep creating. Thank you to Clay for making an awesome video yet again for us here at the Solitary Series. Oh, I need to up time menus. Um, so as we saw, shortcuts can be a great way to get into a menu that we don't need to assign to a physical key on the camera. This is something that you may go into every now and again. And the two examples I've got here are my sensor flip mode. So on Monster, I can flip my sensor, pan and scan it. Flip and flop, I should say. And I've also got my secure format in there as well. So I like to secure format my cards from time to time. So once you've set those up, let's start diving into our keys. So we're gonna come into keys and I'm gonna quickly breeze through my actual physical keys. So on our A button, we've got the sensor calibration for our black shade, so I can get in, make one really quickly because I don't fancy going five menus deep. I wanna get in there through one button. I've got sleep mode. Now, James Lucarelli got me on this. We talked about in the last episode, sleep mode is definitely something that I've been using really, really frequently. Focus peaking for the AC, you can just get it to an easy button and playback preview because the DP is hogging the monitor and he wants playback, but I don't wanna get in his way. On the, a, on the operator side, I've got my the geoscope and the raw slash log view toggle. Just the DP has got his kind of exposure tools there really easily and accessible. On the monitor, I've got my exposure check and also magnify toggle. But obviously if you've got an EVF or a monitor on a different place or different modules, um, you know, there, there's loads of other ones that are built into the side handle. You've got a joystick, you've got buttons on the front and back. So you can really go to town and get anything uh, set up in the way that you like it. One thing that I should note is at this point, just make a reference. You can see here, SK user A press. Make a reference of that, of what this is, because that refers to the module that the keys are assigned to. And that's going to help us when we're saving the preset in a few moments. And now we come to the soft keys. And this is where we really start to piece together everything. Now, this is how it's going to look when we're finished. But let's go through and actually get everything set up. Now, the first thing we're going to start with is we're going to start with the LUTs and the aspect ratio toggle. So how do we make LUTs toggleable and stay on and we can go between and through buttons? So this is the stage we now apply our, look, our first lookup table. So we're gonna come in, 3D LUT, and I'm going to apply my show LUT of one of the Phil Holland LUTs. So I've got that applied, happy days. We now come back to presets and you now press create. We're gonna name this I'm going to name this after the last person. Steve, you're going to be named this preset. Steve, there you go. You're going to be our master preset. I'm going to name that. There we go. And the only thing that we need to copy over is the Creative 3D LUT. Nothing else needs to be copied over at this point because this is the only thing that's going to overwrite whatever is there currently, if that makes sense. So I'm going to press create. We have now created our Steve LUT. Perfect. At this stage, we now go back to our soft keys and we can now apply our Steve, our Steve LUT. There we go. So now our soft key, we can now toggle straight into that lookup table. And now we basically rinse and repeat for how many lookup tables we want. So I've got my interior night and my exterior night that I've made, created a preset, brought it back in for the soft keys. Same goes for the nine by 16. So let's come out. I wanna have my nine by 16, but just because I am lazy, I don't want to type in that big long number. I'm gonna do four by five and do it at 0 0.8. So 0 0.8, let's get that applied in there. That's our social media frame guide. We're now coming out to the presets. I'm pressing create. Who are we naming this one after? Gregory, I'll just call you Greg because this is long. There we go, Greg. There you, go. you are our second preset. And at this point, the only thing we copy over is the action guide. There we go. We now go in, we assign that to our last soft key. And at this stage, 
the whole left side is now ready to go. So where's Greg? Greg's going to be down here somewhere. There we go. There you are, Greg. Boom. So we're now ready to start making these fully rounded presets. So let's go and have a look at how we're making our main preset. Because at this stage, you basically want to have everything exactly how you want it. This is your default. This is what you're always going to default back to when you're shooting day to day. So once you're happy, let's come in and start finalizing these. So as opposed to me creating one, I'm going to show you the one that I've already created. So you're going to go create. I'm going to go into update. And most people will come in and they'll just copy over everything. They'll go all, 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 all. And that's good and bad. It's good because it's quick. But then the negative is that we need to take out the ISO. We need to take out the creative luck. We need to take out the action guide. And there's going to be a long list to scroll through. So I prefer to just copy over everything that I want in my specific preset. So action guide. I put action guide in there because at the moment it's set to off. Then that way when we toggle our 9x16 or our Greg preset, it will overwrite. When we load the main preset back, it's then going to turn it back off again. Color space, exposure time target is shutter angle, just for those of you who are following along at home. Fan settings, frame guide, our image output transforms, um, our monitoring settings, so what our director is going to be seeing in Video Village. Remember, we're going to change that when we go to the VFX mode. Project frame rate, we've got our custom list, we want that in there. Remember, our SSD user buttons and our sidekick, we've made a mental note of that. And to go through those, you simply come into key and you then find all the keys that you've been um, utilizing. Scrolling down, sensor frame rate, the shading, the shortcuts, our time code settings, and finally our UI soft keys. So make sure you copy over one to four and A, B, C, D. I know we haven't set up A, B, C, D later, but it's gonna save us a lot of time. So we've done that. Anything else you need, there's so many things you can copy over and have in a preset. If you wanna have your, so what's in here? Operator UI settings, you wanna have our, our um, a certain port disabled. We can do all of that through these presets. So this is all super cool. And once we're happy, we're gonna save it. So come in, press save. And now we've got our main master preset. So go back in, assign that to the soft key, and then come back and update it. So we come out, we go to settings, set up keys, soft keys, we apply our main master preset, we now go back in, and the only thing we have to do is just simply press update. So we come back in, main preset, update, save, it's now got that soft key in there. And now it's really easy to make all the other presets. So all we've got to do is, we've got to come in, we do clone, at this point, it's going to clone everything. So, so you're going to want to clone that. At this point, you now apply that preset. So for example, we have named that S35 mode. And just start making those changes. So S35 mode, the only thing we're changing is going into 6K. So we come along, we've applied 6K. We now go back in, we update it, and we apply that back to our soft key menu. Let's do the same. Let's go load our 4K 120. Uh, let's apply that one. Now for reference, say we're making this on an 8K Monstro and we want to move it to a 5K Gemini. As we've assigned everything as, oh, there we go, it's applied. As we've saved everything under 8K, what will happen is when you load it into the camera, it won't make any changes to the resolution. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to go back in assign the resolution and re-update the preset. So it'll make changes to everything else, just not to the resolution. Even if you're um, in 2K on the Gemini, it won't take it to the max resolution. I hope that, hope that makes sense. Basically, you've got to go in and re-update the preset. So for our slow-mo preset, we've cloned it, we've named it, we come back out, we make our changes, 4K, 144 degree shutter, 120 FPS, come in, update it, apply it to our soft keys. And the final one that we've got to do is we have to do our VFX mode. So I'm going to come in, I'm going to apply my VFX mode, clone it, name it. Sorry if you can hear some bikes driving past outside. And for this one, we're going to go to the lowest compression possible. So six to one, maybe my shooting compression ratio is nine to one because I want to maximize the recording duration on my card. 
We're gonna turn off the frame guides because the VFX guys wanna see the whole sensor. And we're gonna come into monitoring and actually now apply that VFX overlay. So in VFX mode, they get their specific metadata that they want to see on set. And at this stage, we should now be rounding off the preset. So we're coming into settings. We've got all of our hot keys, all of our soft keys. Everything's tested, it's all now working together. And now basically, we're now gonna move over to the Ranger and get this all moved over completely from stock. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm just going to boot this camera back up. There we go. And at this point, we can start copying everything onto our card. So we're gonna go into image, 3D LUT, copy those all back onto your mini mag. The, uh, the AC might be bringing his A camera saying, all right, Johnny, can you set the rest of this camera up now? Certainly. Or maybe I've hired in a second camera for my own personal camera. I wanna get these presets on there. Um, we're gonna go into overlays, custom, get all of those copied over onto the mini mag. You can also copy these onto your machine as well. We're gonna go into presets and copy all of those over. So you can see we've got our lovely Steve and, and our Greg preset somewhere. There we go, Greg. So all of those are copied onto the card. And I'm actually just gonna turn off my LUT so that when we're looking at the camera here, it's looking normal. There we go. Now, if you guys would like the base presets that I've built today, drop us an email at solitaryseries.red.com and we'll package it into a nice link and we'll send you that link and you can start playing with them from a, from a base level. So let's eject this, there we go. You can see that my Ranger Monstro here has been completely reset to stock. So there's no cheating going on here. 8K, 2 to 1, 23, 9, 8. There's no soft keys. I'm just going to plug my card in one moment. There we go. Plugging that card in. Now, just going to reiterate this. The Ranger has more SDI ports than the DSMC2 Monstro. So if you wanted to configure them slightly differently, we'd now need to go in and re-update those. Obviously, unless you've got the production module attached, in which case you've got those three SDI ports. Right then, the card is now mounted and there's two things we need to do before we start copying stuff over. What we're gonna do is, we're gonna come in to our project setup. We're gonna go into slate and we're gonna assign our camera letter. So on this camera, we assigned it to E or A, just make sure it's not called A again, so there's no duplications there. We're gonna assign this one to B. So we've assigned that. And the only other thing we've got to do is come into setup, keys, soft keys, and just tick show key actions as labels. You can see nothing is applied there. So at this stage, we can now start copying everything over. So I'm just going to do this quickly. All of those, get those all shifted over. Copy those over, lovely. We're going to come out, we are going to import our overlays. So custom, copy all of those back. I now want to copy over all of my presets, bring those over. Now these files are really small, so you could store them on a Dropbox, even store them just in your email cloud or on a little USB that you always have for you for whatever job you're going on to. Right then, now all we have to do is apply our main preset and from that point onwards, the preset is completely live. So let's apply it and hope that everything works. It will work. There we go. Our frame guide has been applied, 5% scaling, 25 FPS, 8K. And if I tap on the side of the screen here, we can see they've all now rippled in. All of those have now come through. Let's have a look on this side. All of our LUTs have now come through as well. So let's test it. I'm just gonna press mode here. So let's apply our show LUT. That's now working. Let's make sure our nine by 16 is being calculated. Our nine by 16 has now been applied. But now the DP is saying, hey, we're doing S35 under slung. Could you please set that up? Certainly can. I want to do S35 mode, getting that loaded in. I now need to sensor flip my sensor. So I'm gonna come in, I'm not actually gonna do it, but I can now flip my sensor. And we also want to do the nine by 16 because we're doing a social media shot again. And you can see that it's calculated that for us. There's no need for us to go work the math out. Now let's change our LUT to our night interior. It's getting a little bit late here in the UK, so I'm gonna to wanna to change that over. And you'll notice that when I go into my VFX, into my 4K mode, that lookup table is staying applied. 
There's no base lookup table. Whatever we choose, that's the one that's staying applied. There we go. I can see it's getting a little bit dark in this scene. I want to go up to, um, let's say, 2000 ISO. We've assigned 2000 ISO. And we're going to go back to the main preset. Our LUT and ISO will remain exactly the same. Because that's how we've configured the preset. There we go. 2000 ISO, 25 FPS, and red ST4. So that's how easy it is to make a preset. At least I think so anyway. You know, there's, there's quite a lot to digest there, but it just shows how powerful and unique you can make the presets to exactly how you want to work. I saw a couple of discussions about some of the things you could do. If you've got the motion mount applied, you could have different ND levels or buttons that toggle through them. There's so many things you can do with them. It really is thinking about the way that you work and what's something that I go into a lot. Oh yeah, actually go into the audio mode to change my levels a lot. Well, why don't I map two buttons to do audio levels up and down? Ah, there we go. You know, all these things is what you can consider. Um, so can you preset? Can you use presets to switch from motions to stills? So you've actually got a little button down here to go into the stills, the stills mode, I guess you could say. So you can swipe up from here and go into the camera mode of stills. But what you could basically do is, like in James's previous lesson where he talked about setting up this stills mode, all you would do is you would go in, configure your still, uh, your your red code burst. So say in our recording options, we're actually doing red code burst, and we're doing zero frame, zero frame, and we've got a little side handle to trigger that. At that point, save that preset as your stills preset. Then you make a new preset that's going to be your motion preset, and then you can toggle between those pretty much instantly. There, there's quite a lot of info there. Sorry, I, I had to really compress it down into it. I had to try and get as much into this as possible. And typically when I'm on a job, this will kind of take me half a day or something because I'm talking with the DIT, speaking with the DP, other ACs. Hey, um, what, what would you like on your A button? He, he wants that on his A button. The, the other AC wants this on his A button, um, the DP. Oh, yeah, what, what numbers do you want on, on your geoscope? Oh, yeah, let's check that our, our buttons work. So if we come out, A takes us to our, 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 our sensor balance. We've got D that goes into our playback, and it's also a toggleable button, so it takes us out of playback. Um, what have we got? Oh, yeah, geoscope on the other side. So when we get out of playback, oh, yeah, we're out of playback now. Geoscope, that's now been applied on there. So all of that's following through. So if there's any other questions, let me know now. Happy to answer them while we're here. If there's any questions about the menus, we can dive into those. So I'll just let a few people potentially ask some questions, let those filter in. I'll be interested to know when everyone's potentially getting back onto shoots, actually. Um, if anyone's potentially got any shoots coming up, let us know. I'll be interested to know how people are starting to get onto shoots. I've seen a few posts on Instagram of people fully PPE'd up and when they're eating lunch, they've got to sit six feet apart and all the food is completely baggaged, uh, packaged up. Uh, for a time-lapse preset, we do actually have some plans to do a time-lapse um, solitary series. So you can basically take what we're learning here and apply that to when you set up time-lapses. Um, but it depends how you kind of really want to work with a time lapse. Some people do time lapses as one frame a second. Others will come into the recording modes um, and set it up as interval time lapse timer, for example. So as long as you know the mode that you're setting up, when you're scrolling through those preset functions, you can just look through them and go, ah, time lapse trigger, perfect. I'm gonna copy that onto my preset. So realistically, anything is possible. Just spend a couple of moments scrolling through all those preset options to see what the camera can do, because chances are anything. Can you create a preset on your Mac? Um, not at the moment, so everything's got to be in camera at the moment. Um, there used to be a tool for DSMC1, but uh, not for DSMC2, because obviously it's a completely different kind of architecture. For the frame guides, oh, so so Juan, so in terms of the frame guides, the reason why I didn't do 100% was because I'm kind of doing a David Fincher style where I'm giving myself some wiggle room. So obviously it's a personal preference, but I basically like having some side to side and up and down wiggle room. Uh, and 100% would basically go to the full width of the sensor, but depending on if you want to stabilize, you're giving yourself that little bit of wiggle room. 
anything else coming through yeah answer the frame guide one um you know actually what some people do is they shoot the 8k sensor and they actually create a 6k frame guide and they've got a huge amount to be reframing um which is some really cool use cases for that actually i'll just see if there's any more questions but i think at 40 minutes that's probably going to be quite a nice time to wrap it up um i hope everybody's learned something here um this is something that whenever i'm at a trade show and i'm bouncing through my presets people are like how do you do that how do i set that up so i really hope that this has been useful for you guys uh, and you can take this forward onto any reds that you go on to use um or any productions that or any future cameras that you're purchasing as well again drop me an email or the solitary series team solitary series at red.com there's a little link down below if you want me to send you the presets i built here so you can have a kind of a good idea of where to start building off and you can modify it and all those kind of things so drop us a little email but i think at this point i will say goodbye stay creative stay safe and we'll see you next time thank you for joining me Also very fortunate in this day and age is there's so much great camera choices out there in the marketplace. So why did I choose red? Look at the end of the day I need a workhorse, something that won't let me down and it has to tick as many of my boxes as possible. What I use day to day has to fall into three major categories. Image quality being number one. It has to be easy to use, on set and all the way through the post-production process. Third is size and weight. I've never been emotionally connected to brand names or logos. I've just jumped between cameras my whole working career. Always in search of something that can deliver a better image in the least time possible. So my reason for using RED cameras is purely logical. Speed and performance are the two things that will give me a creative edge. It's as simple as that. For me, image quality is everything. Some say resolution is not important, but for me it is. I shot a lot of 10 by 8 inch film in my photography days, which was probably and still is the ultimate in resolution. Having all that resolution gave me so many options to reframe and resize with no worries about grain. And yes, the lens had to perform as well, or well, the resolution was wasted. 8K resolution allows me to push in 100, 200% and reframe. It's like having two or three lenses on the same camera during the same take. The more resolution and deep data there is in the raw container, the more dynamic range I have meaning the more colour grading choices I have, meaning the less noise there is. It's simple schoolboy math. You can't argue the science, even though people love to try. I realised many years ago, back in my film days, that lenses dictate the overall look, density, sharpness, contrast, mixed in with distortion and flares and colour aberrations. You can push and pull all you want in the colouring suite, but you're never going to change a lens's optical look or character. So for me, that's where the look comes from. So if you're after a cinematic look, you have to use a lens that gives you that look. The red sensor will capture all the information and more so, but only you ultimately decide on that final look. This is why I collect so many lenses, and I'm always on the lookout for more. They're all artist brushes at the end of the day. There is no such thing as a bad lens. The camera itself is as easy to use as an iPhone. Actually, it's easier. Actually, you can operate the whole bloody camera on an iPhone. But really, it's as easy as this. Turn the camera on. Frame rate adjust. Color temperature adjust. Focus. Press record. It's seriously that simple. There's something in there for everyone's needs. Anyone that says red cameras are difficult to use obviously haven't used one. It's not rocket science. Overall, red has made my shooting life so much easier. I'm actually getting quite lazy with exposure and colour settings these days, only because I don't live in a colour-baked world anymore. In my 35mm days, I had to be like spot on with everything, but now I'm in a raw world, meaning I can change all that information later. If I'm in a rush trying to capture a performance or a shot that I could lose any second, or have completely disregarded the colour temperature and I'm underexposed a couple of stops, all sorts of things can go down. But I don't really worry at all. There is so much latitude in the raw file that I can easily retrieve my desired look. Framing and capturing the perfect shot is more important to me. 
I do a lot of visual effects work. 3D tracking can be an absolute bastard on noisy shots and doing chroma key work can be an absolute pain in the ass also. But the 8K resolution makes it so much easier. And honestly, if I couldn't do any of this on a laptop, the deal would be over. But I can. I change my rigs nearly every shoot. One day I'm shooting a feature film, the next minute I'm shooting a TV ad, then I may send the camera underwater, then I'm putting it on a tracking arm or in a helicopter or hanging off a drone, and then the next day I'm on some rounder world junket shooting handheld out of a backpack. I have no idea what my next job is, but I know I can configure my red camera to adapt to most things I throw at it. Being able to edit, resize, reframe and grade 8K RAW all in real time is an absolute godsend for me as it gives me so much extra spare time to be more creative. At the end of the day, the camera I choose needs to be a Swiss Army knife. But irrespective of how good my tools may be, content will always be king. But you need great tools to capture great content and that's why I've chosen RED. Have a great day everyone.